Okay, hold on. Oh, We're. Okay. Yeah. We jumped. So this is the foundation portion of our board meeting where we get to recognize staff, students, uh, community members for excellent work. And tonight I have the opportunity to highlight three GIS teachers that were honored with awards at the Randall School Staff Convocation on August 17th. Carrie Wyant, sixth grade teacher, science teacher, received the Transcendia Incorporated Excellence in Education Award. And Granville Education Foundation presented the Jody Van Tine Award to two teachers this year, Amanda Tucker from the Art Department and Janae Giovanelli, uh, our gifted English language arts teacher. So I'd invite uh, Janae and Carrie up to receive their award. <laughs> so, uh, so the Jody Van Tine Award was established to recognize distinguished and significant educational contributions made by educators in Granville schools. This award is given annually by the GEF to commemorate uh, the high ideals that characterize the life and career of the late Jody Van Tine, who was a second grade teacher at Granville Elementary School. Uh, Amanda was nominated by a parent of a shy and anxious student who bloomed through the opportunities and experiences created for her in the art room, and Janae was nominated by a parent who saw their student benefit from, from her rich and varied project-based learning approach to curriculum. And uh, Ms. Swank was nominated by her building principal for her work in the area of science education. And um, obviously they are a small sampling of the quality teachers that we have in Granville schools, but they are very mighty. So <laughs> thank you very much for all that you do um, we can't thank you enough for the support that you give our students, so congratulations. Next, I'd invite Ethan Shaw, body president, up to the podium to give you an update on what's going on at GHS. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Mr. Brown just said, I'm Ethan Shaw. I'm the student body here at uh, GHS, and I'm, yeah, I'm just going to give an update on what's going on. So last week, uh, this weekend, homecoming happened. Uh, I'd say it was a success. Is uh, Con I Joe was not played once. On the, dance. <laughs> <laughs> so the music is, was drastically improved from last year. <laughs> but uh, on some more general terms, uh, GHS Athletics are doing phenomenal this year. Uh, the field hockey team, the volley te volleyball team, and the boys soccer team are all currently undefeated, I believe, with every other sports team having only like one loss. So it's a really solid year so far for fall athletics. Uh, the fall play is going to be John Lennon and me. It is about a girl that has cystic fibrosis and how she meets a friend in the hospital. Uh, academics wise, the Chromebooks have been a big thing this year. Uh, at the start, there were some kinks, but I think finally the hardware has been ironed out. Uh, some of the few concerns that students have had with the Chromebooks and what I've noticed is that I believe the internet infrastructure has not been updated as, as well with the Chromebooks. There seems to be a lot of internet crashing at the start of the periods, like the first five minutes, hmm. uh, due to the sheer influx of users getting onto the internet. Uh, as well as the printer situation, uh, currently there's only one printer that we can print to. Whereas last year we could print to the study hall printer or the West Wing printer. So it's a bit more of an inconvenience. I haven't had any issues or haven't heard any issues with like jamming or anything, but it is a bit of an inconvenience compared to last year. And another complaint I've heard from students at the start of the year, uh, personally my student fees went up a lot. And it's not that I, I believe it's due to uh, a lot of my AP classes uh, purchasing five steps to five books. 
And it's not that students have an issue with paying them, it's just that when we see that large increase, uh, we just kind of want to know where the money's being spent. So if there's any way to increase transparency with student fees for next year, uh, I think the students wouldn't really appreciate that. Okay, and great. That's the general stuff that's going on this fall. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And just for the record, we have plenty of bandwidth. The issue is is actually um, coming from our, our network pipe from LACA. So Glenn has been working on it. We updated the infrastructure, but, but it is something that is really happening. We're, we're continuing to work with LACA to figure out how that is occurring because the bandwidth is there. It's just having these intermittent issues. So pretty perceptive. But yeah. we're working on it. Yeah, thanks for the update. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Okay. okay. Now, I would encourage everyone to stay, but we are going to get into our staff reports. And if you have to go, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> three teachers <laughs> and students who have homework. <laughs> yeah. Brian, did I leave my pen up there? Oh, yeah. thank you. So I would, um, as Ryan's getting queued up, we are going to do a report to the board related to the release of the local report card um, that the state of Ohio releases related to academic performance. I would just highlight the fact that um, we tend to share this information only as an FYI. It's not necessarily something that is overtly um, driving everything that we do. I think we have a continuous improvement planning process that is even more rigorous than this data uh, that drives the instructional changes and practices um, that we have been uh, monitoring for quite some time now, over seven years. So with that, um, putting it in context, Mr. Burnett. Thank you, Mr. Brown. And if you have any questions while we're going, please interrupt because there's a lot of information here. Some of it I will gloss over. Some will go into a little more detail as we go through it. So, uh, any questions? Just, uh, just fire them away. Uh, the first thing is the report card this year is a little different than last year. Um, math and ELA is still the same, grades three through geometry and three through uh, sophomore English uh, for the ELA piece. Science is the same, grades five, eight, and biology. Social studies is the same, grades four, six, U.S. history and government. However, after this year, we will no longer see the fourth and sixth grade uh, social studies test. So this year's fourth graders and sixth graders will not take a social studies test. That's one of the reductions that the state made. There are, is rumblings that there may be other reductions in the future, but that's all we have for right now. We know we're not giving those tests this year. The main difference is right here, the OGT has been retired. It was a long, beautiful rain at the top of the graduation uh, hierarchy in the state of Ohio, and I, don't, I do not miss it one bit. Um, but it's no longer there. Now, students can still take the OGT, I think, until 2022. We don't have any more students taking the OGT, so we are officially done with that test. Um, we do have a normal release time this year. We're back to that fall uh, time frame, and there are six components that we're going to go through this evening that are listed right there. Next year, we'll actually get one overall grade from this. This year, we just got the six components grades. You can kind of tell what our grade would be based on those, um, but we will get one overall ranking next year for the district. So our report card um, this year looks like this, and there's obviously four A's, one B, and one not rated. Um, we'll talk about that not rated later. It's not punitive in any way, shape, or form. It's just based on uh, an end size in one particular grade level. So that's nothing to be concerned with, it's just an NR. A lot of schools in the state have NR, um, especially schools that are similar to us. Um, when I look at this grade card, this is the most positive grade card that we've had since it's changed its format in the last three years. Um, we, can, we can talk about, is that a good thing? What does that mean? Uh, in both directions as we go through this. What it does is it validates that our students um, on this one assessment, on these one days that they take them, are performing at very high levels. It's an external validation of what we're doing. Uh, however, you know, it's not the end-all, be-all either. There are lots of other measures, like our quality profile measures, um, that we take uh, with just as much, um, we look at with just as much um, information and data uh, changing our programs as we go through the course of the year. 
So the first component we're going to look at is this achievement component. And I want you to keep in mind as we explain these that these are supposed to be really easy to understand. And to understand. So there's no problem following along with me on this. Um, first thing is there are two parts to the achievement component. One is how many indicators you meet. And the indicators are all the tests that are given in all of these areas. So if you actually counted all these tests, we don't have an indicator for physical science. We only had one student take the physical science test, so that doesn't count for us. Um, in that particular area. There are 23 different tests that our students took, plus this gifted indicator down here. And however many indicators you meet, what percentage of that uh, gets put into this little chart over here and you get an A, B, C, D, or F for this portion. So this is 25% uh, of the overall achievement indicator. We met 23 out of 24 indicators. Uh, we did meet the gifted indicator. And that gives us a 95.8%, which is how we get this A right here for that sub-portion of the achievement. Now, the one area, you know, you always, when you have one outlier, go your eyes go to, well, what's this not met right here? What's going on? Look at the end size of the students that we have taking this test. It's seventh grade mathematics, we only have 87 students that take that test. We skip almost 60% of our students from sixth grade math to eighth grade math. Uh, it's part of a natural acceleration that we have built in. Um, to our grades four, five, and six, and then to pre-algebra, which is eighth grade math uh, curriculum. So, you know, we, we are taking off almost 100, this year, the past year, was almost 110 students that skipped seventh grade math. That's going to affect your indicated percentage, and they were still at 73.6%. Um, so we're not going to go, you know, we're not going to put extra students back in seventh grade math just so we can meet that <laughs> indicator. That's not the purpose of this. We, you know, we know that's going to be a challenge area for us. They met it last year, they didn't meet it this year. We'll look at data and see if there's any gaps potentially in curriculum and, and that's the extent of that conversation. The gifted indicator is actually met by three different other indicators. So it's one indicator on here but it actually has three pieces to it. Brian, before you go into that, I think you we want to reference the fact that our, our students that we did accelerate into eighth grade mathematics also scored extremely well because 97% pass that assessment, which is, you know, obviously an indication that they're appropriately placed yeah. in that content. Yeah, that score of 97% is the second best in the state. Yeah. Being by one school at 100%. So um, we have a goal now, I guess. Um, <laughs> so the gifted indicator right here is the three portions of this. Your gifted students have to score 118 on the performance index, which we'll talk about performance index here. Um, you have to get so many input points in how you identify and serve gifted students. Um, and then you also have to meet progress. Your gifted students have to grow appropriately. We met all three of those areas. There were only 12 districts in the state that did meet all three of those areas. So that's why we met that indicator. So 23 out of 24, we get 95.8%. Remember that number because that will be important here in a second. Our performance index is just how the students actually perform on the test. So you have students that are untested. Um, that decide not to take tests for whatever reason. Sometimes that's medical. Um, you know, students are unable to take tests, and we actually, they, they count against us sometimes. Sometimes we get waivers for students, but very often um, they actually count against us. If you remember a couple years ago, that number was in the hundreds. So uh, it's not a, a huge impact, but it is an impact. All the way down to advanced plus. Now, the state considers the advanced uh, to be the highest you can score. So this scale is out of 120 points. For every advanced test a student takes, you get one point, a weight of 1.2, well, times 100, it gives you 120 points. But if you accelerate <laughs> a student to another grade level and they score advanced, you actually get up to a 1.3. So the gifted indicator, to meet that, you actually had to get a PI score for just your gifted students of 118, or excuse me, 117. We scored over a 118 in that particular area. So. Um, very proud of that. It's a, it's a very high score. It's a very high benchmark uh, for your gifted students to reach. Um, so you get different amounts of points for how students score. Advanced plus is 1.3 all the way down to 0.3 for limited and 0 for untested. And multiply that by the percentage of students that scored in each of those areas and you get this performance index. Last year we were 104.4. This year we're 106.1. That 106.1 is divided by that perfect score of 120 and we got an 88.4%, um, so that is a B for this particular area. Now this portion of it is 75% of the indicator. Now just those two things by themselves I think are relatively okay to understand, but then we get to this page. And now what you have to do is take those percentages and you're given points on a five point scale 
with the indicators met multiplied by 25% and the performance index multiplied by 75%. So if you remember from that, uh, indicators met, we were 95.8. That put, gives us 4.75 points. If you read that real closely, it's like 95 to 97.4. So that gives us 4.75 times 25%, and that gives us um, <laughs> 1 point, was that 1.288 points, I believe. Yes. All right, and then our performance indicators, our performance index, weighted index is 88 point whatever percent that was. That gives us four points here, and four times 75 is three. Then you add these two together, and if it's above 4.125, you now get your A. See, I told you it was easy. Uh, but that's how we got an A this year. What we did better last year, because we got a B in this indicator last year, what we did better this year was our performance index was higher. So we got a few more points here. Instead of getting 3.75, we got four here, and that four was enough to push us over to get an A. Only 13 districts in the state got an A in achievement. Uh, and that's due to the performance of our students and the work of our teachers. Uh, a few other things I pulled out, some of these I already mentioned. Uh, 106.1, I said, you know, was top 13 in the state, top 2%. Our students with disabilities, their performance index was in the top 25 in the state, as was our gifted students performing this index. Um, so all of our students did really well in terms of performance compared to other students in the state on this test. And then 13 of the 23 subjects tested were in the top 40 in the state. That's out of over 600 districts um, in the state of Ohio. Any questions on that? That's probably the, one of the more trickier ones to understand as we go through it. Okay, K3 literacy. Um, is really just a measure of taking students who they, the state considers to be off track, and that's based on a diagnostic we give in the fall with MAP testing, um, to on track the next year. If you have less than 5% of your kindergarten students off track, then you get a not rated for this particular subject area. And that's why we got a not rated for the K-3 literacy component, because this past school year, 2016-17, I believe we only had three or four kindergarten students who were off track. That's well below 5% of the kindergarten population. Um, so we get an NR um, for this. But basically what this measures is how many students are off track at the start of the previous school year. So in this case it would be 15-16. And then how many are on track of those 10 were on track in 16-17. Um, and those are, totals are valued up. But since we were less than 5%, um, in kindergarten, we get an NR. There's no particular grade for this. Um, the state average for this particular indicator is the lowest end of the C, which is 23.9%. Um, so our average last year was 23.7.3%. Because our end size was so small, we actually don't um, get a score. Uh, this year, I can tell you, in one particular grade, from second to third grade, um, through the work of our teachers during the school year, and then we had some summer intervention that we've not offered as widespread as we did this past year. Uh, 21 of the 31 students in second grade last year who were off track are now on track at the beginning of third grade. Um, so we're seeing some real dividends from some of that early literacy work we're doing with more students in grades one and two and three. So Ryan, with these numbers, that's fantastic to see how much we're improving with those kids that were identified as off track. But I notice as you look from grade to grade, and I'm not sure if this is the pr progression, like there's kids that become off track that would have been previously on track. Correct. Is that like just a data issue, or is that an identification issue, or is that just an asynchronous development, or what's kind of your sense for that? Because like, I mean, it'd be great if they always came off and stayed off, right, and no others went on. Like, what, what's your sense of that? There, there's a couple things too. Like, first of all, map testing in kindergarten and first grade um, mm -hmm. is read to the students mm -hmm. because they're not able to read in kindergarten. Yeah. So it's, it's almost more of an auditory comprehension test. And so you do see a little bit of a jump when students get into second grade when they have to read the test for themselves the first time. Now, we also give a diagnostic at the end of the first grade year where the students have to read it themselves. So it's not a surprise to us which students those are going to be. Uh, but they're going to get new identifications, especially in this group right here. You have some students, to be very honest with you, uh, Thomas, that you're going to, they're going to be off track every single year. We're trying to get them to that next level. They're growing, but they may not reach that benchmark that the state wants them to reach um, as they're going through it. And then as you go through, you also get kids that go off and on, off and on, off and on. And that's really just because you're also dealing with six, seven, eight, and nine-year-old students taking an online map test. That's about as variable as it gets, um, yeah. you know, <laughs> right, yeah. in, in terms yeah. of yeah. 
you know, if, if they had a bad day, you know, maybe it's a click, 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 or you know, maybe they really focused when they hadn't focused before, right. and all of a sudden they're scoring off the chart. So you have to kind of take that with a grain of salt, and we never use one test. This is what the state wants us to use to identify this, but we're not going to use just this one test on this one day to right. serve kids. It's going to be multiple data points that we're going to use, including DRAs, DIBBLEs, things like that. Great. I um, think the other piece to this is we, we have always had watch lists. Uh, this metric did not force us to, you know, look at kids who are off track. We we just now have to comply with their, yeah. you know, RIMP plans or mm -hmm. reading improvement plans. But we have always measured students that were right. off track and right. kept track of them um, through a variety of different processes. And right. Amy's shaking her head <laughs> yes. So yeah. that's uh, my sense. Is we've always had processes that are far right. better than kind of what's required or what's tested for. And I, I'm really proud of that. Yeah. Right? It's neat to see that maybe it reflects too. Sure. And yeah. so I think the next slide will, will answer some of your questions as well. Because related to this is the third grade reading yeah. guarantee. And the students have to reach some kind of benchmark during the year, either on state tests or on diagnostics like MAP or Terra Nova. And once again this year, we had 100% of our kids moved on to fourth grade this year. We've, we've not had to hold back a student from a reading perspective um, in this district in the three years that this has been around. Now, students sometimes take different pathways to get there. They may not pass the state test in terms of what the passing score is, but they might pass a MAP or a Terra Nova. But the, they're all, they're supposed to be concorded with each other, um, so they're like assessments to give the student just two opportunities when they're nine years old. And you know, I would really challenge the legislator to <laughs> spend the day when students are in the room taking the third grade test in the spring and feel the tension in that room with, from nine-year-old boys and girls. Mm -hmm. It's really kind of disheartening uh, is the word I would use. Um, so, but they know the seriousness of it. Our kids do a great job, and, and they jump through that hoop. Um, the main thing is that we're providing that, um, that service to those kids. Okay, graduation rate, this one's pretty straightforward. Did the student get a diploma or not? Um, and they look at um, the five-year graduation rate, so this year is the class of 2015, and the four-year graduation rate from the class of 2016, um, the class of 2016, this is always a year behind. Um, so you might say, well, you know, seven kids, we had seven kids not graduate in 2016. Um, we had um, almost all seven of those students uh, were students with disabilities who stayed a fifth year in our district and went through things like Project Search. Or we actually began college with them, but they stayed enrolled in our district. They don't actually graduate. They walk at graduation because they are graduating from our program, but they haven't officially graduated from the state. Those come against you. So, um, you know, those students, because we're serving them an extra year, is why that is not higher. And you see in the fifth, in the fifth year one, um, there's a few extra. The three students that we can't account for here, um, they don't always end up in our district. For example, if a student starts with us and spends a year or two with us and moves away and doesn't graduate, that actually counts against us uh, in this metric. So um, lots of things going on there, but our graduation rates are very high. These are very um, similar to what they've been in the past. Um, the main thing is that four-year rate, if we choose to serve students a fifth year, you might see that a little lower um, than you would expect. Um, we're gonna do what's best for students. I, I think that's a great point. And the board needs to recognize that that's actually in federal legislation um, and the ESSA plan that the state just submitted had to include this component with no ability to carve out students with special needs which we advocated against um, and and will probably do some type of federal advocacy um, around this issue because it really doesn't make any sense and what I think could unfortunately happen is students not uh, be provided opportunities because it might make a district look bad. We don't have to worry about that. Um, I just worry about the broader picture. Okay, the gap closing component. Um, this, I would say this one's a close second or maybe tied for first in terms of ability and easy to understand. But basically what you're looking at is subgroups here. Uh, any subgroup with an N size of more than 30 um, you get a, a grade for in this, and it's all based on 100 points. So we'll look at English language arts proficiency first. First of all, you'll notice we have five subgroups. We have all students, which we have 1,282 that took tests, um, 68 economically disadvantaged students, 41 multiracial students, 1,185 white students, and 145 IEP students. These other ones are listed here, but they're not subgroups because they're not over 30. That will change in the future. That number will get smaller and smaller due to ESSA. Um, over the next uh, five years as that rolls out. But right now it's at 30. 
Then the state sets a benchmark for each subgroup has to pass, 77.1% of the students have to pass the ELA test. This is for grades four through eight. And so like for example, all students, we had 84.5% pass. Since that's greater than 77.1, voila, we get 100 points. So that's an easy one to understand. If you look at economically disadvantaged students, we did not get 77.1, we got 64.7. But over here, you'll notice that we got 51.6 points. And the reason for that is we improved 6.4% compared to last year. And since that's half of the gap that was present, we get half of the points, basically, or 51.6. So you can also get points, partial points, for improvement on this. Um, for our uh, multiracial students, actually, I'm going to come back to that one and save that one for last. For our white students, 85.1, so we met that, we get 100%, uh, 100 points. And then for our IEP students, 47.6 is below 77.1. However, we improved by 5.9%. So since that's about 20% of this gap, we got 20 points uh, for that particular um, area. Now, the multiracial one's really hard to explain. I hope I do it justice. You'll notice that we did meet the indicator, but we got 100 points. Um, and I actually had to look at this twice when we first got the results back. Because we grew 2.9 percent points compared to last year's results, and our gap is only 1.5, so in other words, we improved more than the gap there was between passing and not, we get the full 100 points. Because the theory behind that is, if you have one more year of that, you've now, met your, you've now closed the gap. They've met that particular target. So you add up these points and divide it by the 500 total to get 74.3 percent. With mathematics, again, we have the same groups. Just a quick question. Is yep. it a gap from all students? I mean, what is the, what's the gap that's being measured? The gap to from to 77. The 47.6 to the 77.1. Oh, the goal. Yes. Yeah. The gap the goal. to the goal. Okay, yeah, the goal. So because we improved 5.9% to this 29.5% gap, that's why you get 20%. So the theory behind that is you do that five years, you'll meet the gap to get to that point. Uh, from a math perspective, um, we passed four areas. The, the math goal is a little bit lower at 72%. IEP students was at 60%, but because we improved 0 0.9, 0 0.9 is 8% of 11.2. That's why we got eight points. So divide 408 by 500, and you get 81.6. And the final area of gap closing is the graduation piece. Now, these end sizes are small because it's only one class, and you only have two different subgroups, all students and white students. So we got 200 out of 200 for 100. Now what you do at the end of this is you take all three of those percentages, add them up, and divide by three to get an 85.3, and that's how we ended up with a B. So the difference between this getting a C last year and a B this year was that one group, the multiracial ELA group, where we got an extra 100 points because our gap was smaller than our improvement. 63% um, of the state schools got a B or F in gap closing. It's a very rigorous measure in terms of um, your subgroups. And as that end size gets smaller, it'll be even more difficult to reach. And the end size will get smaller and the goal will go above 80%, which is what is expected for a typical uh, student to perform. So that will move above 77% and 71%. Okay, prepare for success. Uh, we can all define success in our own ways. The state chooses to define Define success by the student being um, remediation free in the ACT or SAT, and there are certain scores on the ACT. It's a 22 in math, 21 reading, 18 in English. Um, that's most of our students, all of our students take the ACT now that are juniors. Or they can get an honors diploma, or they can get an industry credential. This is actually a two year measure, so this is the class of uh, 15 and 16 put together. So out of those two classes, we had 308 students that either were ACT or SAT remediation free earn an honors diploma, or earn an industry credential. Then out of those 308, you get bonus points if they get a 3 and an AP test, or if they would pass an IB test, which we don't offer, um, or um, they get three college credits before they leave high school. So out of that 308, 197 got an extra .3 bonus points uh, for those. So you just multiply these two numbers across by their point value, add them together, and divide by the total number of students. We had 408 students in those two years, and we get 90%, and that is the cutoff for a day. We just uh, barely made that indicator. Only 12 schools in the state made that indicator um, to get an A in uh, prepared for success. That's going to go up next year, so we're going to have to improve um, in this particular area. 
A little side note, the class of 2016, the ACT average was a 26, and we just got, are we allowed to say that yet? No, oh, okay. Class of 2017. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was, The ACT yeah. average? I <clears throat> know. Uh, Can't say that yet. It's good. Um, <laughs> it's still a bargain. <laughs> it's still a bargain, sorry. Yeah. Uh, almost 89% of the class took the ACT. Next year, when we get to the class of 2018, 100% will take it. So we'll get a true idea of uh, the whole particular class. And then finally, the uh, progress component is how do you get your students from point A to point B um, ba based on their previous uh, performance. You'll see all the subjects listed here. I know it's kind of hard to see, but um, at every grade level and every subject, green means they experience above expected growth. Kind of a yellowish gold color means they received expected growth, and red is below expected growth. And you see a lot of green when you look at our um, when you look at our charts, and that's because we were above expected growth. Uh, the way they calculate this is how much the average growth per student was above, and they divided by the um, standard error. We were over 21 standard error measurements above expected performance for the average student, and that put us at uh, ninth highest in the state. Our students with disabilities had the second highest growth rate in the state, and our gifted students had ninth highest in the state as well. So, however you want to measure any of this, what this tells us our students achieved at a high level and they grew at a high level. That's really hard to do, uh, and I think that's um, you know where you say great job by the students, the parents, and obviously the teachers and the administrators working in the buildings to make sure that happens. Um, we got A for all these different areas: students with disabilities, gifted all students, and then students in the lowest 20% of achievement, which is lowest 20% in the state, not lowest 20% in Granville. That's a very small end size for us. And that is our state report card for this year, four A's, one B, and one NR. I'll take any questions that you have after that lengthy presentation. Yeah. So I, I don't recall the exact numbers and letters from last year and so forth, but it seems like this is an improvement. Is that attributable to anything? Is it just kind of more experience with the test is, tests, or what's, what's your sense about what's moving us in this direction? Because I don't think it's been like our primary focus, like we mm -hmm. said. Maybe Where is this heading? <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe so. You know, I think right. we focused on just good instruction in the classroom. Yeah, yeah. Project-based learning takes kids to new levels. Yeah. Um, I know teachers tried some of those things, maybe just in small pieces last year. Um, you attribute that to what's going on in the classroom with the staff. That's where the power of this uh, is measured from. And our, you know, our staff does a great job of looking at what are the standards, but they also do, it, I think, an even better job of where are my students at and how do I take them to the next level? Because it's not just this group of students is growing or this group of students is growing. All students are growing. When we're talking about measurements in the top 10 out of 600 districts in the state, now we can talk about how valid those measures are, but we get those year after year after year after year tells you they're doing something right. Uh, and it's because they care about each individual kid and getting them from point A to point B. And that's where the power of that is. Cool. That's great. Any other questions for Ryan? Phenomenal results. Yep. Yeah. In, in the near future, you will also get a presentation on the quality profile. Just some of the things that we highlighted that go beyond just academics. I think one of the the great aspects of this Board of Education is that you have always prioritized a well-rounded education. And so we try and uh, highlight some of the student leadership activities, um, learning activities, uh, partnerships that are formed, um, support organizations, um, and all of the extracurricular activities that we provide that really I think give kids an opportunity to find their passion and purpose, which is part of learning for life. So um, that kind of complements this this data. Th this that's external validation. The quality profile is our internal way of saying, "Hey, our kids do a great job," and so do our staff and parents and community. So, all right, Mr. Bernath, you got that queued up. Now I am going to give you the riveting. Um, oh policy update uh, from OSBA. I can just, that's my idea. It's not going to happen there, so I was pretty, it's going to bother me. Um, Hit that little arrow to the right, it'll, that whole right side will go away, it'll get bigger. There we go. All right, so 99% um, of what I'm going to go through um, is part of the budget bill that was passed this summer, House Bill 49. Now, you think, why would a budget bill have a bunch of educational policy changes? Um, 
That's a great question. But yeah. that's, that's kind of the trend of how we pass um, uh, education policy in this state. So um, a couple of the things that I'll, I'll highlight, business advisory councils to the board, that's a policy requiring that. Um, we already have that through CTEC. All of the CTEC programs have a business advisory component to them, and we are allowed to um, join in on those business advisory committees. And also, Dale Wellen, who is our Lincoln County ESC um, new superintendent back there, Wave Dale, he, he hosts uh, monthly uh, business advisory council meetings where superintendents can attend as well. So we already have that in place. Um, there are some uh, administrative, administration of federal grants, fiscal accounting and reporting procedures, purchasing re procedures for uh, levels of how much you want to uh, give Mike and I the ability to spend without board approval, um, school property disposal, first aid, emergency closing, closings. Um, the first aid and, and really in Kevin's world, the Lindsay Law, um, which talked about sudden cardiac arrest and, and some of the uh, requirements for training of coaches. All of those are a piece of this. The basic curricular program um, also took, took, um, eliminated the uh, social studies assessments um, from grades uh, fourth and sixth grade. And um, College Credit Plus, College Credit Plus was really the one area that was not part of the budget bill in, um, in its infancy but it is a constant revision process because that policy was ill-conceived from the beginning and they are having to tweak it over and over and over again. Um, one of the things that we advocated for was there to be a means test for textbooks and for other credit that did not get, make it into the budget but there was significant conversation around that. Um, Career advising, really looking at workforce development, interscholastic athletics, again, talking about some of the things that uh, were referenced early related to Lindsay law, Lindsay's Law. Um, interrogation and searches was really a, a based off of a, a court case that was um, adjudicated, and uh, so we updated that policy related to our search and, and um, seizure activities if, if we were to engage in that with student behavior. So all of these are required. Um, they are, there's some permissive language here and there related to um, what you want to offer. The policies that you'll approve at the second um, reading will outline which ones had permissive language, but it's not really a, a choice. Um, it's, it's pretty uh, common sense for us. So those are the policies. Um, you know, I think the, the most important um, piece to this is, you know, a lot of times policies are passed without funding mechanisms to support them. Um, we call them unfunded mandates. And there are several of those uh, within this, this uh, last budget bill. So, FYI. Thanks for all the great advocating you do for appropriate policy and so forth. I think that's really well spent time. Um, relative to College Credit Plus, what, what's our total financial liability associated with that unfunded mandate that's been around for a couple of years? Is that so like main last higher year, medium or? Last year, the tuition piece of it was about $40,000, and the textbooks, I want to say, were six or $7,000, okay. roughly. Okay. For those people in the audience, College Credit Plus was a new initiative by the General Assembly to allow students to take uh, college coursework, um, and in their words, free, and I'm putting that in quotes because nothing's free in this world, um, the local tax base does pay for that college credit. Um, there was no means test, so uh, it doesn't matter if you live in a, an extremely um, expensive home in Granville. Uh, the, the state of Ohio uh, requires us to pay for that credit, um, even if you have the ability to pay it. So um, most of our students, because we have a lot of AP offerings, choose to take AP coursework because uh, it does transfer across state lines. If you, if you take College Credit Plus, that credit is good only in the state of Ohio. So um, Thanks. hopefully that helps anybody who's unfamiliar with it.
The other thing that was listed in there from the curricular program were, were the graduation requirements for 2017-18 uh, school year. Remember they had to uh, do some gerrymandering of the pathways because of the new assessments that were um, catching kids in a catch-22. <clears throat> Any questions? No. Now you go from a policy update to the financial forecast. So. Yeah. It's getting better. Give it a second. There we go. Okay. So this is the October forecast. I have to say, I'm now very disillusioned. I thought all those people at the April presentation were at the board meeting to hear the five year forecast. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently they don't come back again to hear the, the October forecast. <coughs> oh, it's exactly very slowly. Um, looking at the October forecast compared to the May forecast, um, the overall financial um, position that we are in actually has improved a decent amount um, since the, the May forecast. The primary reason for that was the cost of the health insurance change that we've made where the reductions in premiums were a lot bigger um, than we had anticipated them being in the forecast, that's a good thing. Um, and so you'll see that our overall cash position, if you look at the 1920 um, 20 school year, um, we do now expect to be a little over a million dollars of cash. Um, but really the key item of the forecast that has not changed since the May forecast, you see the right arrow up there, and that is our revenues relative to our expenditures. Um, we are taking in more than we are or we are spending more than we are taking in. That began with last school year um, as our levy cycle reached its peak and we're now on the downward side of the levy cycle. Um, and you will see that growing. It, it stays stable for a couple of years and then begins growing again. The stable, especially in 19 over 18, is a combination of the health insurance change and um, this 18 is the last year that we have to pay on the old um, Household 264 note, and so that expenditure <laughs> goes off, and the combination of those keeps our us kind of flat in 19, uh, but then in 20 it starts reaccelerating as our expenditures again grow faster than our revenues do. As Mike's uh, forwarding that slide, I think I'd also like to highlight the fact that. Um, the insurance change that he's referencing was a part of a joint conversation that takes place uh, yearly with the GEA in the insurance committee. And, and I want to you know, recognize the fact that the GEA really partnered with us in looking at our escalating costs and trying to do something different to bend that trajectory. So kudos to the GEA for recognizing uh, you know, the position of rising costs in insurance. Um, if we take a look at the current year's budget and what has changed <coughs> on the revenue side, um, you see our property taxes are a little bit higher than we were anticipating. Um, that is because the reappraisal that we're going through in 2017, the growth rates, especially in residential property, are greater than we were assuming they would be back in May. Um, and that's leading to about $100,000 extra that we're getting in real property taxes. Unfortunately, almost exactly offsetting that um, are the changes from the state budget from what we were anticipating in May. Remember in May, the budget at that point was still in the Senate. Um, we, you know, we had some ideas what it was gonna be, didn't know for sure. Um, but the transportation changes that they made, which I'll talk about a little bit later, and the per pupil um, base cost cuts that they made um, cost, are costing us, I say, pretty much what we gained in property taxes um, above where we had been in May. None of the other line items on the revenue side have changed 
very much since the May forecast. On the expenditure side, again, most everything is about where we expected. You see the kind of pretty big drop in the health insurance side of it, and that, and that was, again, the renewal um, based on the, the new structure of the health insurance. And again, all the other line items are not really statistically different from what they were um, when we talked back in May. Enrollment. Um, where we are right now, big item, um, the kindergarten class year share is actually not quite as big as I had been anticipating. Um, we thought it would be somewhere around 170. Um, it is just 158, which is still almost 20 kids higher than it was last year, just not quite as, as far ahead as we thought. And really the other item this year um, is the net mobility is down a little bit from where it has been the last couple of years. If you look at the 2018 column to see where we are right now in enrollment compared to last year, and right now we are down three kids from where we were last year. Um, net mobility, which is essentially the survival rate of kids who are in kindergarten through 11th grade last year, showing back up this year in first through 12th grade, along with move-ins and move-outs. Um, our history was saying that we normally should have gotten about 70 kids through that procedure in net plus, but you see I've had to manually move out 23 of those 70 based on our actual enrollment. That's why I'm saying we were a little bit below where we've been the last few years in net mobility. Um, we have an ongoing issue where you look at the size of the kindergarten class coming in relative to the size of the senior class that left the prior year. And you can see we lost 50 kids um, through that process where the kindergarten class was 50 kids lower than the um, senior class last year. So in other words, we've lost 50 kids that way. We've gained 47 kids through net mobility and that gets us to the minus three kids, which is where we are sitting right now. Generally, or hit what prior years have told us by the end of the year, end of the school year, we will probably be above last year. Um, we tend to have the breaks, both winter and spring break. Usually we pick up kids during the breaks more than we lose um, from families moving, and that has been the case, I think, every year since I've been here. Um, so by the end of the year, my guess is we'll probably end up about five kids ahead of where we finished last year. So again, a pretty stable environment. If you look at the forecast going forward, um, it's a net very slow growth over the period in students with about half the years going down and half the years going up. But the up years are a little bit bigger than the down years are going down. So by the end of the five year forecast period, and right now we're expecting to be about 40 kids ahead of where we are right now in total. Questions about enrollment? Good job slightly over forecasting kindergarten enrollment. I think maybe the first time you've, over, you've overestimated enrollment. <laughs> it seems like they always surprise us, so we're getting really close. That's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Although we never, I mean, it's never that. It's never no, we're always close. Fun. We're always yeah, close. The other one, they all show up in the same grade. Yeah, exactly. You can never um, tell like what happens there. they have a couple times. Yeah. <laughs> I think it will be interesting to see what uh, we we see in first grade because we always anticipate about right. 20 additional or yeah roughly 20 additional students to, that come into first grade. It'll be interesting to see what happens with that kindergarten group uh, next year uh -huh. in first grade. Yeah, maybe they just they'll name their else. Um, revenue overview. Um, if we take a look at the prior five years and then what we're expecting right now. Um, in the prior five-year period, really was overall we had about 4.4% <coughs> growth in our operating revenues. Biggest chunk of that is um, you know, the pre real estate, which is about 65% of our revenue, went up about 4.5%, about the same as the average as a whole. And again, that is primarily driven by the levy that was passed in 2013. Um, that's driving most of that growth. 
Uh, you see the public utility is quite a bit bigger than, than the, just explained by the levy. And that was, remember the one year we had a 32% increase in our values. Um, so that drove that. State funding grew at about the same rate as property tax did. The restricted aid, um, a lot of that was because we don't get much, first of all, that it's 127% of a very small number. Um, that growth, that annual growth rate is a very small number. Most of that was a combination of um, the state funding more catastrophic costs than they've funded before. Um, and that's really the biggest piece of this for us is catastrophic. Plus the tech ed classes that we added last year that we get as additional weight of funding for. Um, the property tax allocation actually dropped over the period. Um, that is primarily because the last five years included the phase out of the tangible personal property tax reimbursements. The last two or three years of that phase out were in the first couple of years of the last five year period. And so that's causing the negative number in there. The big jump in all other operating revenues is primarily because we started doing the um, all day kindergarten with tuition. And so that what's really driving all that growth are the tuition revenues from our kindergarten offerings. If you look over what's going, what we're projecting going forward, uh, real estate taxes at about one and two thirds percent per year. Um, biggest jump is obviously in 19 after you know, we get most of the impact of the reappraisal from this time. Um, a little bit kick in 21 after the trying to update in 20. Um, but even with the reappraisal, which you'll see in a minute, was a little over 15% on residential. That only adds between one and three quarters and 2% onto our actual revenue take. Um, the tangible, the public utility property tax is expected to be about three and a half percent per year um, based on historic growth. State funding, is supposed to, we're expecting an average increase of about a third of a percent per year in state funding as opposed to the 4.6 we got in the, over the last five years. And literally all of that growth, even more than all of that growth comes this year. Um, we are getting a bump this year. You see we are expected to fall next year because of the transportation change that the district that was made. And then I'm ex anticipating beginning in 2020 that we are gonna be on the funding guarantee which keeps the revenues essentially flat um, over the last three years of the forecast period. Um, the restricted aid, um, you see a big drop this year. We had a very large catastrophic cost, um, at least historically, reimbursement in fiscal year 17. 18 is not anticipating quite as big of a reimbursement. And so that's why the big drop in 17. Now there, after that, it's pretty stable between one and 2%. Um, the property tax allocation, you'll see that moving about in line with real property taxes, which is what it should do, since it's tied directly to that. And then you see the kind of yo-yoing of the all other revenue. Um, there's a combination this year. We added a fourth all day kindergarten class, which is adding tuition, plus we're getting the ramp up of the TIF payments at River Road. Um, we are anticipating, because we're expecting a much smaller kindergarten class next year, um, I am anticipating only having enough kids for three all day classes next year, which is why you have the drop in the all the other effort, all operating revenue, and then going back to four classes again in the 1920 school year as our kindergarten enrollment picks up again um, and so you get the bump up again and so that's why you're getting the yo-yo effect in other operating revenue on the revenue side i know this graph is a little bit busy um, the blue arrow at the bottom is really the important part um, we're anticipating from the state getting about 6.36 million dollars this year um, in total state aid. By 2022, we're expecting to get $6.33 million. So after the jump this year, we're expecting to actually lose about $28,000 of revenue uh, per year um, by the time we get out to the end of the, of the five-year forecast period. 
Um, the big items you see, the black circle that starts a couple down on the left, you see our transportation aid. Last year was almost $600,000. This year we're anticipating about $460,000, dropping to about $410,000 in 19, dropping further in 20 and going forward. That's because of the change to the formula. The two year, the first 18 and 19, the change to the formula that impacted primarily wealthy districts um, that reduced our aid. The core per pupil funding amounts this year, the top red circle, um, 6010 and 6020 is going up $10 per pupil. The last few years have been going up $100 per pupil. Um, that is obviously having an impact on us. The state share um, of core funding, you see right, we actually went up this year from 31.7 to 33.4. That was primarily a function of us having fairly flat valuations when a lot of the state, especially the agricultural part of the state was having big increases in their agricultural property. Plus we've been gaining students, so we've been getting relatively poorer. Um, you see the 33.4 to 29.2 between 19 and 20. That is a direct impact of our 15.7% reappraisal this year on residential property. Since that's 85% of our value and it's going up almost 16%, uh, we are getting a lot wealthier on a per pupil basis because of that. And it gets reflected in our state share index when we get out to 2020 and then again in 2022. We are getting a lot wealthier in the eyes of the state funding form. In the, that is <laughs> in the eyes of the state funding form. <coughs> clarification. I'm not telling Richard. <laughs> And then you see the, the other black circle to the right there. That is how far I am anticipating we are going to be onto the guarantee in fiscal years 2021 and 22. Um, you know, really between six and eight hundred thousand dollars a year um, that we will be guaranteed funded. What, what essentially the guaranteed funding means if you let the formula go, we would in 2020 get about six hundred seventy thousand dollars less that we got in 2019. The assumption is, based on what the legislature has done every year for the past how many, however many years, <laughs> that you're usually guaranteed at the prior year funding. Um, so basically, the state will give us $670,000 to keep our funding flat between 2019 and 2020. That is a source of um, risk. Yeah. So the forecast is if the state does not do 100% guarantee, I believe we are at risk. Probably not for all of that money, but maybe for some portion of that money. Hmm. So the, the core funding per pupil is what the state is saying. That's the overall per pupil funding from the state, but we only get the percentage that is our... That is share. correct. So right now at 6010, the state is paying us 33.4% of 6010, which is a hair over $2,000. And the other 4,000 is assumed to come from our taxpayers. Um, the 2017 reappraisal, uh, if you take a look where the blue arrow is this year, um, we're expecting our ag values to go down by about 6% but our ag values are only about five or six percent of our total value. The residential from the reappraisal are expecting a 15.7 percent increase um, based on data from the county auditor. Um, the class two property, I do not have a final number. That would be business property. Um, first number I got was 13 percent growth. The second number I got was two percent growth. Um, they said neither of those are correct or somewhere in between. So I just pick somewhere in between um, until we get a final number. So we're using seven. Honestly, if it's four or if it's nine, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference to the forecast. Because again, class two property is only about 15 percent of our total valuation. So it's not going to make a big difference in the forecast, um, even if I'm off three or four percentage points there in either direction. 
expenditure overview. Um, again, looking at the prior five years, um, over the five year period, our salaries have averaged annual growth of about a percent and a half um, over that period, um, a little bit lower than inflation. The big impact there, as well as in the benefits, was the 2013 RIF that we did, um, where we eliminated 19 positions. Um, that, the long-term impact of that was holding down the salary growth. Um, you see the benefit, in the benefit line for 18 and 19, the very low growth rates. That is the impact of the healthcare changes that were made um, as part of the collective bargaining agreement. The salaries are expected to grow on about an average rate of 4% um, over the five-year forecast period on an annual basis. Keep in mind that is a combination of steps, base increase, and additional employees. Uh, this year where we have almost a 5% increase in our salaries, that includes 40 positions. Um, the two global scholars, or global studies positions, at the elementary school, an additional kindergarten teacher because of our increase of enrollment, and a fourth grade teacher to meet enrollment needs as well. Um, so, yeah, you have both of those going in, and we also are anticipating, based on enrollment, adding a position in both the 1920 and 2021 school years, which is why those growth rates are a little bit higher than the other years. On the benefit side, um, for health insurance, um, what we do, yeah, we do know what the change was is going to be on January 1st of 18, um, which again, depending on which plan um, our employees take, there's a choice of two high deductible plans. Um, the, the lower of the two plans has a 12.8% reduction of premium from this year. The higher of the two plans has a 26% reduction in premium. Both plans for our renewal 119, we are guaranteed a renewal that's no higher than 10%. It can be lower than 10%, it cannot be higher. And then the out years, I am still in forecasting a 12% increase, which is kind of the high end of trend nationally right now. The hope is that um, with the switch in the insurance and a lot of the, the education and the incentives built into it that we don't see that high growth rates um, in the out years. Like the uh, previous five five year annual change, yeah. you noted that include the impact of the 2013 RIF, which would reduce that number. You separate out the 2013 RIF, what was the average um, annual increase? Um, I would have to go back and, and recalculate because we also that year remember we had one year where we had a zero base and no steps and so there was one zero in there that way and a second year where there was a one percent base and a step. Um, I would guess that that it's going to be maybe a percent higher than that but I would have to go back and actually do the calculation of that. The other items, um, looking forward, the big jump this year, materials and supplies, probably is not going to happen. That's in the budget, because I budget each year assuming that diesel fuel prices are going to go back up so that there's enough money if they do. Um, as of right now, they don't look like they are, so that big jump in material supply, that big, that big a jump probably will not happen once we get to the end of the year. The, big, the capital outlay, that looks like a huge number, but that's, only, that's like $20,000. Um, and that's just the timing of some stuff from last year falling into this year. Because um, you see the negative number over the five-year average. And so that percentage gets way out of hand. Um, you see the big, the big jump and then decrease in the debt line. Um, this year is the first year we'll be making payments on the lease purchase. Um, that we did to do the energy conservation project. But it's also the last year, as I said before, the House Bill 264. And so you get that big drop next year of the payments for the House Bill 264 falling back off. Questions on, any other questions on the expenditures? 
I think the question about the salary is an interesting one, and it might be worth a little bit more evaluation there to understand kind of salary motion in general relative to, you know, to subtracting out the RIF and the ads of headcount and so forth to try and figure that out and also just really understand how the changeover to a younger staff has helped or what impact that has had to kind of put those numbers with a couple other qualifiers to help us put our minds around historical and current the trends. The change in the staff is actually an interesting dynamic because we had the series of retirements because of the STRS changes and those taking effect. You get a net, a quick drop because you're replacing more experienced teachers with right. newer teachers, but then the cost of steps go up because the steps are more Higher heavily younger, weighted yeah, right. in the first 12 years of the salary mm -hmm. schedule. Mm -hmm. So the steps go up as teachers start getting years 12 and 13, the value of the steps go down. Right. And so mm -hmm. we had a run up of the cost of steps and now we're actually yeah. turned the corner and now our cost of steps is going down because we're having big chunks of teachers over the next three or four years hitting the point in the salary schedule that the steps go from being two or three percent to more like a half to one percent. Right. And so it slows down. So there, there is a dynamic kind of in both directions from year to year there. Mm -hmm. But I'll go ahead and take a look at it. Might be interesting to see. Thanks. <laughs> Summary of the, the labor agreement that was reached back in the <laughs> spring, um, the base salary increases, um, are two two and two and a quarter for the three years. Um, the big change is the health insurance, where we have switched from a traditional PPO to the two, as I said, the two tier high deductible health care with health savings accounts. Um, we are making contributions into the health savings accounts. Again, the amounts vary depending on which plan and whether it's certified or classified um, employees. <laughs> Um, and then there is a cost sharing um, that takes place beginning with the renewals uh, in 1119 and 1120, um, where the share is it can be as high as 50% of the cost is absorbed by us and by the and by the um, employee share. And the way we're implementing the employee share of it is through reduction in our contribution to the HSA. Um, mm -hmm. And so. The, um, I think, again, as, as Jeff said, I think working with the association, um, I think we have, have something that's much more sustainable um, from a budgetary standpoint uh, that hopefully will do a better job of pulling our costs in what's obviously a very uncertain healthcare market right now. Um, that's really the end of the forecast part of the presentation. Um, what I want to talk about, spend the last few slides talking about, um, is kind of the forecast and the levy needs, and then a little bit of discussion about yeah, the levy options that we're looking at leading into the board discussion that we'll have on the topic here in a little bit. Um, as I said, the finan overall financial outlook has improved since the May forecast, but not really enough to change the timing um, or really that much the magnitude of what we need levy-wise. Um, the state budget cuts have hurt us in the long run. Um, it, you know, it's in, in one year, it's enough to, yeah, we can absorb it, but it, it, those changes that the state made are really costing us about a million dollars aggregate over the five-year forecast. Um, and so that is, that really had an, has an impact on where we would have otherwise have been. Um, we are, as I said, we are anticipating a new levy during the five-year forecast period, um, and our cash balances are expected to approach zero by the 2021 school year. This is a slide you've seen this about the last four presentations that I've done, um, just as a reminder. Um, you know, we are expected to be on the ballot next year, and we do still have capital needs that we need to address as, address as well. Our PI levy expires in 2019. We can renew it. Um, I think it would be nice to be able to put together a levy, levy strategy that would not have us renew it, that we can deal with our capital in another way, but that can be renewed. 
Um, that 1.7 mil levy it makes up about 70% of our capital expenditures or capital revenues for capital expenditures. And keep in mind, we are not getting enough revenue right now to meet our capital needs because of our aging infrastructure. The half bill maintenance levy that was tied to the bonds that were issued back in 1993, um, that expires next in 2019, and that by law cannot be renewed. And that provides about 15% of our capital budget. Um, the bond millage rate that we have right now um, because of the bond refunding we did in late 2015, um, we are expecting to be able to reduce the millage there by probably a little under a half a mil, somewhere in the half mil range in 2019. And then the bottom point, the special assessments for the Graham, Newark Graham Community Authority, primarily park trails, that again is about 15% of our capital budget, which is what we're required to use it on. Those of special assessments start phasing out in 2021. Um, those are 20-year assessments from when the homes were first occupied. They were first occupied in 2001, and so we are starting to cut up on the 20-year mark. And about 85% of that revenue will go away in the first five years um, from starting in 2021. So again, just by itself of what we have here, you know, we're facing a 30% drop in our PI money over the next seven or eight years. Um, some of it more immediate than others. And as I said, we really don't have enough money now to meet our infrastructure needs. Um, so, you know, we've been looking at an earned income tax um, as well as a property tax um, with the idea being to be able to do enough, whether we do an earned income tax or whether we do a new property tax levy, to do it at a high enough level to allow the PI levy to expire, along with the half mill levy that has to expire, and with the bond millage drop, um, to allow our property tax rates to drop by about two and a quarter mills and then take about 2.75 mils of our current inside millage that's being used for operating and move that over to permanent improvement. And that be the, that will put in, give us an influx of money. It will also, because it's all inside millage, will let us get growth on that part of the millage going forward. And that's really an area of the budget that we need the most growth for because that's an area, you know, we have increasing needs and we have little control over the costs other than by not doing maintenance. You know, the main, it, it's three years from now, it's going to cost more to, you know, to pave a, a parking lot than it's going to cost to pave a parking lot today because of inflation. And we, there's no control we have over that. We have to do it. Cholos are going to cost more, boilers are going to cost more, roofs are going to cost more. So to give us an opportunity to get a growing PI source is going to help us offset um, some of those inflationary um, pressures. Mike, Mike, in that case we're taking operating millage and moving it to the permanent improvement budget. What, what flexibility or limits are there on that and how can we shift existing levy revenue like that? What are the constraints on that? There actually are no constraints on it. Um, Either way, you, it basically there's a procedure that's set out in the law for what that the board has to follow to do it. Um, we could, if we wanted to, I wouldn't recommend we do it, but we could move all 5.2 inside mills that we have to PI. Um, there's nothing in the law that stops you from doing that. What a lot of districts do with this inside millage swap is if, there, if a district's at the 20 mil floor, which you know we're not in quite in the same universe as the 20 mil floor, <laughs> but districts at the 20 mil floor, what they can do is they can move the inside millage and actually create a tax increase. Hmm. Because since the operating millage can't fall below 20, and right. the inside millage counts towards the 20, by moving the inside millage, they still have the inside millage and they still have 20. But since we're not at the floor, that will not be the case here. Here, it's a revenue neutral right. move. Um, but we have the we have the authority to move as much inside millage as we want. And there are districts in the state 
um, that have moved 100% of their inside millage to either bond or PI, primarily PI. Um, but mostly it's been to take advantage of the 20 mil right. floor. We're doing it really to meet our, as a strategy, a long-term strategy to meet our capital needs. Right. But, um, but remember, it's once, not, once it's in PI, it can only be used for capital purposes. Right. It cannot be used for operating. And it can't switch, but you can't move back. You, right. you, it can, yeah, you can reverse it back through a similar procedure like you used to move it in okay. the first place. So you, yes, you, I mean, you yeah. could at some point decide we'd rather, we'd like to mill this back in the operating mm -hmm. and go through a process where you move a mill back. And right. yes, you can do that. Okay. It's not, it's not a once, you, once you do it, you can never mm -hmm. undo it. Because we talk in the district about different budgets for operating and permanent improvement, but in reality, from the taxpayer's perspective, right, it's all coming from the same place to some extent. So it's nice to know that there's that level of flexibility. I'm not sure how or when we would ever use it, but it's good to understand that better. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So why an earned income tax? What, what is it about the demographics of Grandville um, that make an earned income tax a viable alternative and, and, an, and possibly, yeah, a potentially tra attractive alternative. Um, what I was able to do is I was able to get some data from the Department of Taxation where they matched home, um, home addresses with incomes. They can't give me every single one, but they gave me some aggregate data that I asked for. And some of the information I found out, out of that, this was done based on state tax returns filed April 15, um, 2015, um, is the interesting things I found is one was looking at um, senior citizens and senior owned homes. And the process we used with the Department of Taxation, they were able to match about 73% of our homes to income tax returns, which is essentially becomes a pretty darn good sample when you've got 73%. Of the ones that were matched, 26% of the parcels that were matched, so over one in four, the taxpayer in their state income tax return claimed a senior citizen credit, meaning at least one of the house, household members, um, yeah, if, it was a, if it was a joint return, at least one of the spouses was 865 or over. Um, that's a pretty high percentage. And the other thing that you notice, and this it shouldn't be a great surprise, but when you look at the household income ranges, um, for those pe those home or homeowners who have household incomes below thirty thousand dollars, over fifty percent of those are seniors. And for those between thirty and fifty, it's just about fifty percent. So it's very you know, our seniors are very heavily concentrated in the lower incomes. Again, shouldn't come as a great surprise. And that percentage does decline as the income goes up. Again, probably not a, a huge surprise um, as we're looking at that. Um, so that's really one of the things. The thing with our income tax is it primarily does not affect seniors. Um, it does not, earn income tax does not tax pensions. It does not tax interest and dividends. It does not tax capital gains which, you know, for most seniors are the primary sources of income, along with Social Security, which is also not taxed under this. So, so that's, that's one of, of the issues here that we're looking at. About what percentage of our uh, citizens or voting citizens are seniors? Do you have that kind of number? How many, what percent? I, I, based on this, I would presume it's about a quarter of our citizens are seniors. So that's by parcel. Or is that by individual? This is by, well, it's not really by parcel. What I did before I sent the data to the department is, you know, one home may have three parcels as part of it. I combine okay. those into a single household. Okay. So I, I did that before I sent the data to the department. So we're not picking up random, essentially parcels with no buildings on them. Um, they're right. all, it's all together. So okay. this is, you know, this is By return. a pretty good measure of households. Okay, great. Um, the second thing um, is, that's really key to look at on this table, the second column for the right, from the right, which is the number 
of personal exemptions per return, which is kind of an indicator of where families are. Um, not surprising since those, yeah, since those under 50,000 tend to heavily be seniors, they have the fewest number of personal exemptions per return. Averaging, you know, 50,000 looks like an average is probably about 1.7 or 1.8 exemptions per return. Once you get up to $85,000 and above, the average is between three and three and a half exemptions per return. So you really, you know, that's where we're drawing students from. And um, I estimated the average earned income in each of those household income ranges. Um, and that's why you see average earned income is you know, below the overall income ranges. I used the household income range measures all income. Um, I used some data for, on Ohio that looked at percentages of income by income group that were pensions and capital gains and the things that are left out try to make those adjustments by group to come up with an estimated average earned income per, yeah, basically, yeah, by the household income range. So again, if you look there, yeah, say you look at the 100 to $125,000 total income range, yeah, and that's on average about 87,000 of that is income that would be subject to earned income tax. Yeah, that, Obviously, for some people, it's going to be the whole 100, and other people maybe 50. But average, based on statewide data, for people in 100 to 125 thousand dollar total income range, is going to be 87 thousand dollars, which is how I came up with that, the data there. And and essentially, what this is doing is it's putting more burden on the people who are using the schools. Um, and so it's a little bit more tied to um, our income ranges. Another thing to look at why is to take a look at our property tax rates that we have right now. Um, if you look at the left hand side of this, right now our residential school tax rates, and this is just for us, this does not include CTAC, is 52.5 mils. The median statewide is 22 mils lower than that. So we are 20, right now we're already have a rate that's 22 mils above the statewide median. If you take a look at the districts in Licking County, um, Licking Heights, because of the new levy that they just passed and made to build new buildings, they are a hair ahead of us. Everyone else is at least eight mils below where we are with their um, rates. Newark, they're at 36. Keep in mind, they also have an income tax on top of that 36 mils. If you look at our business tax rates, the statewide median is 35.7. We are nearly double that. Our, our business tax rates are 66.9 mils. Um, you look, there are only 25 districts in the state that have higher business tax mills than we do, and 583 that do not. And as, you know, we've gotten into economic development discussions and trying to improve business conditions. This is a big issue, and especially when you look at Lincoln County. We are, we're 15 mils ahead of the next highest district in Lincoln County in our business tax rates. And so, you know, even putting aside other issues um, that there are with development, someone looking here, or there might be a site ready place in Heath or Lakewood, and they're looking at paying a third less taxes by going to Heath or Lakewood. And so, again, a property tax further adding on to this um, is going to be a problem um, from an economic development standpoint. And the differentiation in the residential school tax rate is primarily because of state funding match? Or no. is it partially the cost as well? Like, what's the main driver than that, those numbers? What's well, really the main driver there is, you know, the way that property tax rates work is over time as valuations go up, the rates are rolled back. What this is primarily a measure of is that our valuations have gone up 
at a faster rate than the other districts in Licking County. So our higher, naturally higher voted rates have been reduced further than the rates in all those other districts, which is why there's not nearly as much gap in the residential side as the business. Business, we have not had, you know, first of all, we don't have that much business property, and we've not had that much acceleration of values. And so we, in that case, our naturally higher voted rate has not been impacted as much by growing values. Huh. Okay. That makes sense? Yeah, I think so. I'm trying to think what a different metric that I should have in my head for the left side of the chart to, to rationalize or understand why our residential rates are so much higher than our surrounding Licking well, districts. It looks to me like we spend twice as much as the other districts, and that's not the case, right? Um, but the revenue piece from the state is a big piece of that, that's and possibly right, the way the big, millage calculates yeah. relative to you look property at, value. Yeah, the ones towards the bottom, North Fork and Licking Valley, first of all, they have income taxes. And second, they're getting a lot more higher percentage of revenue from the state than we are. Right. Because they're not nearly as wealthy as we are. Mm -hmm. And so they don't have to rely on, right. um, on our local taxpayers mm -hmm. as much as yep. we do. Yep. As a residential taxpayer, it's an indication that you're getting value for your home. Mm. That your, your home That's value is staying yeah. high, but that has an <clears throat> impact on the millage by it maintaining <clears throat> its value. Okay, so the levy options, um, I say we've looked at seven different levy options. We've probably looked at more than that. Um, but at least conceptually, we've looked at seven different structures. Um, again, a big goal, and we've talked about this for two years now, is to do something to address both our long-term needs on both the operating and the capital side with one strategy, uh, rather than having to piecemeal together a levy strategy. Um, the, here I've laid out two options um, that, both ad that address both needs with just a single vote. Um, so we would, have to, we would not have to worry about a vote renewing the PI levy. Um, the other options of the seven or more that we've looked at um, all are more complicated either from a structure or from the fact that there would be multiple, you know, we would have to have at least two votes where we'd be voting both for new money and to renew um, the PI levy. Um, both of these options are expected to carry the district beyond the current five-year forecast period. So uh, the two options we're primarily looking at right now um, is a, either a one and a quarter percent earned income tax or a 9.25 mil property tax. Um, in either case, the district would first receive money in 2019, but then in 2019, we'd allow the PI levy to expire. We have the other levy expiring, the maintenance levy, and then the reduction of our bond millage. And so there would be, in, under either of these scenarios, the following year there would be a two point, a rough, about a 2.25 mil reduction in property taxes for the following payment year. So it would follow about one year. And then we would move inside millage from operating to PI, again, as we talked about, to create a more permanent fund. Mike, so basically in the, 9.25, the total impact would be a 7 mil. It would be a 7 right. mil over two years. Yes. Over two years. Basically, it would be 9.25 for one year, right. and then it would be 7 mils each year thereafter. And, and in the, and that both scenarios impact all uh, class 1 and class 2? Correct. So it would be a re reduction for residential and business class? Business. Correct. Okay. For both scenarios, earned income tax and for that is correct. The property reduction tax. would be the reduction the second year would be the same under either either proposal. Okay. That's going to be again. It's roughly 2.25 mils. Um, I until we have the exact rates this year from the reappraisal, I don't you know can't quite calculate exactly what it is. But I've kind of estimated what the rates are going to be for each of those levies after the reappraisal this year. The, 
looking at the top part of this, this is, again, this is the same thing we saw on the first slide. This is the current five-year forecast. And the number that we are really trying to address through our strategy is that negative 3.756 million. That is our spending in excess of revenue in fiscal year 22. Basically, we want to get to fiscal year 22 without that number being negative or just a very small negative, which will allow us to carry this strategy beyond the five-year forecast period. Um, so if you take a look at the income tax scenario, um, again, per, based on what, you know, the current assumptions, in 2022, we'd be spending about $440,000 less than we're taking in still, and we will have built a cash balance up of $6.4 million, likely in the next year after this, although there's obviously a lot of assumptions and things that have to happen by the time you get to 21, 22, we'd probably be spending a little bit more than we're taking in by the 22, 23 school year, but have enough cash to carry that on for a couple more years. Really, the important thing with the income tax, and this is, this is what you know, makes the strategy tough, is if you look at the, at the phase in of the revenue from the income tax, we, we would only get about 6% of the revenue the first fiscal year in fiscal year 19 because of the way it's collected, which is very different than a property tax. And you'll see that on the next slide. And so you've got a phase up of the revenue, um, which makes it, that's part of the reason why we have to, if we're doing this strategy, we have to do this in 2018. In 2018 and 19, and even in 20, we actually have, we have enough cash cushion to be able to absorb the ramping up of the income tax funds. Once you get past 2018, the, think about it, this whole thing gets pushed out a year. And now we're only, if we waited until 19, we'd only be getting 6% of the revenue in 2020, and that's going to be kind of problematic at that point because we our cash our cash situation gets a lot tighter. With the with the the 9.25 mil levy, and this is where you see the difference is where the blue arrow is, that first year we get 2.4 million dollars as opposed to 325,000. Um, what that allows us to do, well in this case, in 2122, we're actually are spending a little more than we're taking in, but our cash balance is all the way up to $8 million before we get there. Our cash balance gets up higher because we're getting the money faster. And again, that gives us several years beyond the end of this forecast period until we have to start looking again at, at where we are. Um, so this is a, this is why we've chosen the two. And Mike, um, that nine point two five should not say percent mill. It's just nine point two five mill. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. No, I just I wanted to make sure people saw that. And and I would even propose it should say nine point two five minus two point two five or seven net or right. some rollback right. comment yeah. in there to make sure that that's clear. Right. And the the two point two five. But the thing is, the 2.25 is outside of the op, none of right. it's operating. Right. And the inside millage swap that's built into this is built into both scenarios. Right. I still right. think like yeah. referencing it that way okay. and saying still we've got a 2.25 yeah. mill back roll it. Roll back is good. Okay. Great. <laughs> so just some final thoughts before we wrap up here. I mean, you take questions or at least leading into the discussion. We'll have them a little bit. Um, I believe that if we're going to go the earned income tax route, really 2018 is our only opportunity. Um, if we don't do something by the, by the November 2018 election, this, I think 2019 is too late. Um, as the phasing of the money comes too late. We also have the problem of we can't start moving any of the inside millage over, and that cause, that's going to cause us a problem in our capital budget um, hmm. as well. Um, as the operating, so I think it's really a one-time to we either do it or we don't. Yeah, if we're gonna do it. I think it's a one-time opportunity in 2018. Otherwise, I think the opportunity is likely gone. Um, 
we could delay, yeah, you know, if we went the property tax route, could we delay it to 2019? Yes, I mean, our cash allows us to delay it, so it coincides with the other increase, but it considerably shortens the length of time the new levy will last. Because, first of all, we need to start moving money for capital before we're getting the, the new money, plus, we're not going to have it, we'll have one less year to build up balance. So, yes, we can do it, but then you're really talking about not, you know, maybe getting to the end of the five year forecast period, um, and that's about it. Um, any other option is probably going to require a vote for new money and a vote to renew the expiring PI levy or it's going to be a kind of complicated issue. I mean, there are ways around it, but it makes the issue a lot more complicated um, where you're doing it with one vote. I think the bottom line is the state is going to continue to view us as being a wealthy school district. And their philosophy, their current funding formula, basically is if you have capacity to pay more, we are going to force you to. And, and the only mechanism we have in order to get more money is to go back to the ballot and get money through our local tax base, which is why we've been having conversations for five years now. Right after that last levy passed, we started talking about economic sustainability in this community because our class one versus class two, our class one residential versus our class two business class are significantly different. You know, we are a residential tax base, meaning homeowners bear the majority of the burden of funding the schools. And the state says, and you can pay more. And if you look at that, that five-year forecast, the greatest risk that Mike circled on that one form was that if the guarantee stays in place, and that is not a guarantee. <laughs> so every... Uh, member of the General Assembly on both sides of the aisle that, that I've talked with have said we want to eliminate guarantees. Um, if that were to happen, you know, we have another significant loss of state revenue that would um, equal what happened in 2013, 2012 when we had to reduce $1.5 million out of the budget through a RIF. Um, and at that time, we were slightly overstaffed we are not overstaffed anymore. So what would happen is more of a cut on programs that I think people value. And so those are the types of things that we want to communicate to the public, make sure that people are informed of the facts um, so that people can make a decision about the quality of the schools that they want to have their, their children or their community uh, have available. So um, I think Mike does a, a fantastic job of showing you the data that funnels into the five-year forecast and the levy options, but ultimately it's your decision as far as levy options and the choice that we make and we put in front of the public, and which will then become part of our board discussion later after public comment. Um, we have reached the point in the agenda where we will entertain public comment. If you'd like to address the board, please come to the podium, state your name and address, and speak for three to five minutes. Would anybody like to address the board? <clears throat> Hello, thank you. My name is Guy Manos, 159 Klaus Lane, Granville. Just a couple questions. I apologize. I wasn't here at previous board meetings to maybe to start discussion, but it has to do with capital expenditures. Just a quick question. Um, I noticed the other day we have a new logo and a new corporate resolution, or whatever you want to call it, the other Fraser. Mm -hmm. Is that something that we got for free? Is that something that we paid an uh, entity for? Uh, that's my first question. And then the second one is um, writing for the uh, my bicycle. I went through the intermediate school. I noticed there was a, uh, we had a big roof project that was done there. Was any of that guaranteed or covered by the original contractor? Or was that an insurance project? If you could answer uh, mm -hmm. you know what that's to. And then lastly, um, I happened to work on the treasure for the levy when we did the last earned income. So I'd happy to help if somebody needs some questions or answer some obstacles we faced 
Last time we tried it, happy to. Yeah, that'd be great for okay. sure. And questions. Jen, if you direct yeah. me, I can answer some of That's those easy. questions. Yeah. Yeah. So the the um, the budgeted amount for the uh, rebranding process was uh, five thousand dollars, and um, market trend for that kind of work, it was about a five or a twelve week process, um, was significantly more, um, but we were able to negotiate it at five thousand dollar rate. Um, and then we did receive a rebate on the intermediate school roof based on a defective um, uh, roof shingle um, from GAF to the tune of oh, about $40,000. $40, which was probably about, that was probably about 25% of the original shingle costs. Again, which was 15 years ago, so. And uh, so that, but that was that, okay. And that was uh, so there was no contractor guarantee it would last longer than I wasn't sure. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And, and you had a study. I, I guess I assume we do studies for everything anymore. So uh, regarding the, the, the logo, um, the, the cost versus benefit. I mean, we're watching every dollar now. So that five thousand dollars was we got a benefit out of it, other than the fancy. We're looking G. Right. So, well, so what we went through is a process. First of all, what started this, we didn't pay for, which was a rewriting of the mission statement. Um, that mission statement that was our old mission statement, nobody knew um, in the school district. So we, we supported it with Learning for Life. That didn't cost a penny. Um, that was done internally. Um, but then we wanted to make sure that uh, we had a, a logo that would represent that mission of learning for life moving forward and uh that was what we intended to do with it okay fair enough yeah. yep Thank thanks <laughs> hello uh, my name is ben neighbor and i live at 1777 burke street in randall uh i want to Ask her, I would have to say at the presentation, I can see where we are going to do funds. I understand that. Um, I would throw out a caution that when you say things like, uh, we're going to have the people pay for it to use it, um, I feel like the schools are a community thing. Uh, the senior people that you referenced that uh, their income should be going down, uh, have you thought about the fact that their home values are probably pretty well can be paid off and um, when they go to sell those, those homes or, or their children most likely go to sell those homes when they are moved out, those values are going to be uh, significantly higher because we have such a fantastic school system. Uh, so those two things correlate. So I, I would he hesitate to say that, that a reason to, to pass that tax on to uh, people who have kids in the school probably isn't a, a good reason to but that, that being said, I do think we have fantastic schools, and I, I would like to support that. It's just through an earned income tax. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that's personally the best way to go about that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> would anybody else like to address the board this time? All right, we'll move on to um, board discussion, which is just a continuation of uh, Mike's presentation and the questions you've gotten from the community. So um, did, did you want to tee us up, or should we just go into thoughts, or? So this is a levy discussion. I think the intent is to have a series of conversations at the September, October, <coughs> and November uh, board meeting to talk about the levy options, get community feedback like you just heard from Mr. Yader and Mr. Manos, um, and and start to formulate what you think is in the best interest of the Granville schools long term. And, um, and then obviously that goes to the um, Board of Elections and we have to certify and, and get everything ballot language um, by January. So um, that's the teeing up. You've heard the conversation, so just kick it around. 
<laughs> I think one thing I'm, I'm going to start off with uh, Mr. Yader. Yeah, comment. Um, that's an issue we've heard before that it's a community school. I mean, the schools are part of the community, and that you know everybody should sort of participate and pay in that. Um, I just want we should be clear that seniors will be continuing to pay. It's just this next increase won't affect them um, as much as a, as a pre, the previous increases have affected them. So um, I think that's a message that we want to you know. It, we're not, they're not off the hook, so to speak, but that just the, the, the burden will be shifted a little bit more towards those, those of us who use um, the district. Is that yeah, and, and I think the other piece to what we heard in 2013 were, was a, uh, a significant portion of that senior population were being priced out of their home, so to speak, on the property tax. And we passed by 41 votes. And different economic times, different economic environment. But again, um, I think the margin of victory definitely prompted the board to think about ways to generate other revenue through class two um, business development. And we've had some. Um, but we have not had, we've not made a significant dent because we can't. <laughs> um, as a board of education, we're not developers um, and we're not the village or the township trustees. So um, it really relies on other entities to uh, carry the ball on that. But we definitely heard that from uh, taxpayers in the senior bracket in the last round of um, mm -hmm. the elections. The other thing is we, we hear is people come to Granville to educate their children, and then as soon as their children graduate, they leave. Uh, or their children graduate, they leave and, and, and move and sell their homes. So um, I think this philosophy or this option would um, say when you're here to educate your children, you, you may have to pay more. So that, that was definitely part of the um, thinking behind this option. And the board had discussed that previously as well. It, it's been raised numerous times, though, the, um, the discussion around the philosophy behind um, why we want to do this. So, um, any other? I, mean, I, think it, I think it's great that we started the meeting with the commendation. I think for the first time ever, we've had two Jody Van Tyne Award winners instead of just one, which is like, no, there have been, been but, but, but to have kind of that kind of recognition of just our individual staff, as well as following up with the state report card, which, you know, by that measure, by really any other, we're kind of tops in central Ohio and tops in the state, right? I think it's a great place to start <laughs> the conversation. But, you know, it was really important to hear this five-year forecast and the update and the fact that we're not going to get any more sympathy from the state, whether they take away transportation dollars or whether they take away a guarantee or whether they take away something else, that's going to be the trend in order to balance the state budget that's going to continue to happen. Um, you know, so in, or in order to do the right things for the kids, we need to come up with levy. We're in, used to the levy cycle. It's been five years since our last one, roughly, and that's kind of how long we hope this would last. And actually, it might go a little bit longer, although we need to make decisions and, and vote on something sooner so it can come in time for us to have the balance that we need to continue to pay the bills. Um, so, uh, you know, r relative to the income tax, you know, I'm not opposed, right? But, you know, when I see the numbers like this 1.25 or the nine and a quarter mills, the first thing I did is I put in my numbers, right? Put in my salary and put in my house value to see what happened. <laughs> and, and lo and behold, it's like kind of an income tax is a really bad deal for me, <laughs> right? Because we've got two incomes in the house and we happen to live in an old Granville house and, you know, our property tax reappraisal might fix that and our house value might almost <laughs> double <laughs> depending on how that all shakes out. Um, but still, it'll be kind of a bad deal for us, but I'm not necessarily opposed to that because philosophically, I think there still you know, might be a, a real reason to think about this from our overall community perspective. But I think we also need to kind of dig into it a little bit and continue to have the conversations and get the feedback of the community members and do some real analysis to figure out you know, what's, what's going on in, in the minds of the voters in the ballot box as well as you know, in their real budgets of various classes of 
of people in our community to make sure it's sort of sustainable because I don't want to put <coughs> something on the ballot that just gets voted down, right? I don't think that's really helping us out at all and I think we really need to understand, you know, the feeling of the individuals, the real economic of our community members, right, when we put something out there so we have a high hope that it's viable. Um, so, you know, after I put my numbers in there, that was one thing, but I also kind of put in like median numbers, and I'm not sure exactly what median numbers are for income and house value, right? But it looked to me like median numbers were even a little more expensive for the income tax option than the property tax option, right? Um, and, and that could be partly because I think the revenue generated from an income tax at one and a quarter percent is more than the revenue generated from a nine and a quarter mill. Right, uh, slightly, you know, 10 ten percent or something like that. So there's some differentiation there. Part of the thing is we, because of the phase up of the income tax, it's got to be a little bit higher revenue to get us as far as the property tax that comes in faster. Right, but and kind of again thinking about it from the taxpayer's perspective, right, the person that's going to be voting on it or not, right, it looks like it's more expensive for that reason, right, and kind of the. The number ratio I kind of came up with is, is kind of like a, a four to one ratio of your house value to your income roughly as a break even, right? So if you take your income and you multiply it by four, right? Uh, and that's your house value, right? If your house is more or less than that, then that kind of helps you understand if a property tax or an income tax is more or less expensive. And I don't think people are going to only vote based on which one's cheaper. Right? I don't think that's the way we make good decisions. I think we make our decisions based on utilizing the product and supporting the schools to some extent and so forth. But it's, a, it's an important one to kind of think about in that metric. Um, I also think that you know, it's, the income tax is, is you know, kind of like a 10% higher, like maybe a 10 something mil property tax because of the fact it's just going after a little bit more. But also because it only addresses the residential taxpayers, right? Uh, which is a feature of it that we're trying to go after from uh, you know, economic sustainability and business support perspective, right? It even feels a little bit more than that, right? Because if you were to generate that kind of revenue for the district, the income tax revenue for the district, but only address that in a property tax, it's like a, a 11 or 12 percent millage property tax effective, right? And we'll roll back a couple of that, right? Which helps a lot, but the numbers kind of I think to me felt when I started cranking them through for my own scenario and like every kind of neighbor in class I could think of, like really expensive, <laughs> right? Um, and, and I know that, I mean, nobody likes property taxes, right? And nobody likes more taxes of any sort, right? But I think that in order for us to put something sustainable out there that has a good chance of passing, we need to really kind of get in the minds of our community and figure out you know, this, this value calculation, right? I mean, it's obvious we've got a fantastic product and so forth, but like, how do we assess the real numbers on that, right? And when people start seeing like an income tax of 1.25%, like they're gonna pretty quickly calculate that number and make a decision on it. Um, so I just kind of have gone through that. It's fantastic that we have, you know, excellent analysis. I think that's really a benefit for us. Um, so we don't just kind of throw something out there as a dartboard type thing. And I think there's been a huge amount of analysis to come to this point. And now we really need to kind of can kick it around ourselves and get as much community feedback as we can for our options because we need to do something. <laughs> we know that. Um, and uh, so that's kind of where my head is on it. One thing we haven't mentioned, we would, this would be a five-year. Yeah. yeah, five-year term. When then a five-year term, then a renewal, you know, we would, we would reassess in five years as to where we would go from there. It would so not be permanent. It would not be, it's not permanent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That has not been yeah. thrown out there. I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah. Other thoughts? Um, having read recently in, in the press uh, analyses of how much um, tax money the, the state absorbs from different districts and how much the districts get back and what um, hmm. excess may flow from the districts. Can you address perhaps how much we send upstream to community schools or, I mean, I, I want to make sure that yeah. there's a clear understanding of what else you're paying for that yeah. you really don't have there's, any choice in. Yes. There's 
things that are obvious and things that are a little less obvious. Um, the obvious is the community schools. And last year, um, actually, this week, if I look somewhere else. Well, give me one second. That's OK. Because it's the forecast. That's I think in general. Um, a couple of things that is that are important to know is that when we say our what we receive from the state is you know 33 percent or around two thousand dollars anytime we're funding the another mechanism like a charter school or, or a voucher or something like that right. we are sending that full six thousand right. dollars to that entity so it's not only just a state share, it's the local share. And I think most people don't understand that. They just think that we're just passing on the state share. And that's not, it it, not. That's not happening. But I think Mike, Mike has a better way of saying so, that. Yeah, basically for a, you know, for a student who's just going to community school, um, they are counted as our student. The state does pay us about $2,000 for each of those. But then we have to subtract the full six thousand dollars to give to the community school. Um, define, last year, define community school. Hmm? Define community school. Well, community school for us it's primarily, almost exclusively online okay. schools. Whether it's Newark Digital Academy or whether uh, it's Ohio Virtual Academy, Ohio Virtual, ECOT. Last year we had no one go to ECOT. Yeah. Thank goodness. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, no students go to ECOT from Granville. But the community school cost was $90,000. Um, and we probably got a third, of, the amount we got for the state would have been about 30000 That's actually not where our big cost. Our, for us, a bigger cost are students taking autism and Peterson scholarships. Mm -hmm. And those cost us $234,000 last year. And again, we probably would have gotten about seventy-five or eighty thousand dollars for those students, and then turned around and paid two hundred and thirty-three thousand um, dollars. And to give you an idea, that cost two years ago was about forty thousand dollars. It's, it you know, it's just grown up at a tremendous pace. Um, and those are things we cannot control. We cannot control. We cannot control that. The other thing that I think, Mike, you should share is what do non-publics get from the state in revenue? Non-publics like Granville Christian, um, they get about $1,200 per pupil from the state. So they're getting about 60% of what, for each of their students of what we're getting for our, yeah, there are other districts where their non-publics are getting more per pupil than the district is getting from the state. For us, it's not quite that, but it's still a pretty significant portion of it. Which has been a significant aspect of advocacy on my part uh, down at the State House because I think most people don't realize that. Um, you know, one of our comparison school districts, Rocky River, you know, they have an elementary on one side and a, a Catholic school on the other. And the Catholic school actually gets more revenue from the state than the public school. And, and, and I don't think people realize that in this current funding formula. The other thing I think that's less well known, um, I have occasionally made this, this no, but it's, been, it, it, I haven't, it's not something that I've talked about um, lately. And that is when you look at the amount of money that our taxpayers send to Columbus as part of their state income tax. And so for, Which would be considered our effort, our yeah. local effort. And so if you look at um, if, if we look at 2015 our taxpayers sent just in state income tax almost 19 million dollars in state income taxes to the state when you look at the state aid that we get back from the state we get 
between state aid and the property tax rollbacks, we get about $7.3 million back from the state. Um, so our taxpayers are paying a lot more into the state than we're getting back as revenue from the state. You know, part of that, yeah, that's the design. We have wealthier taxpayers than the state as a whole, but it is a burden right. um, on our taxpayers that we're not, unfortunately, not getting back, which is causing us to it's put more burden on our taxpayers further right. for taxes that do come directly to us. I'll just, I'll just ask, I think as we move forward, really thinking about young families coming into Granville that say they're priced out of the housing market already, that they can't move here, and if they come here and they think buying a house for a certain amount of money and then paying an income tax on top of that with young kids, if they're starting their lives together and all that kind of stuff, just being cognizant of that as, as we move forward and thinking what burden it's going to be. I know we're trying to take the older population off the burden but we also have a kind of flip of younger families on, with lower incomes and things like that and trying to think about the impact that's going to hit those families as well. And I don't, I, obviously that changes a lot through who they work for and what houses they buy, but just to get their input I think would be a valuable a resource moving forward. Are you hearing anything in particular, just having young children yourself and um, I just was curious as if you were hearing anything. Um, I know that I know there are some families that are questioning whether to stay in just because they can't find houses that are if they have two kids if they both have regular jobs, not Granville jobs. <laughs> I mean, it's expensive. Yeah. yeah, place to live for sure. But again, when you're twelfth in the state, you pay for things. I'm happy to pay for that, okay. but it's a burden for some people for sure. For sure. I think it's unfortunate that the burden is significant. And we're, 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 you know, it's kind of, it's a difficult, uh, both options are very difficult because you're, you're, you're challenging the community in either direction. Um, and you really don't have a choice because the state is forcing you to do that. So it, it, is, it is difficult. I think, in, in difficult situations, it's where do you want to place your error? Um, and, and sometimes um, it's the best of your worst case scenario. Um, and so, you know, I think it is a challenge, but I also think that um, people move here for the schools. I hear that every single time a person registered. Why are you coming to Granville? For the schools. Uh, so we are an attractor. Now we might be tr attracting even more people that are even wealthier <laughs> because they, they only are choosing the schools for that one option and they'll understand in the future if we have an earned income tax um, that that's a burden that they, they have to take on. Or, you know, we, we are going to have to try and continue that conversation about <coughs> economic sustainability if we place another residential tax um, uh, on the on the entire community, knowing that they're coming off of a 15.7 percent increase. Well, so, it, it goes to a much larger discussion about economic development yeah. in here, and involves all the entities which we've tried, and we've seen where that's gone. But I mean, when we look at new housing development coming here, Colony Two is geared towards elderly people with no kids. We have the roots empty nesters. We have all this wonderful growth that they're expensive houses that are going to be built but all of a sudden if we have 65 plus people moving here in their age they're not going to be paying for the schools if we've earned mm -hmm. income tax. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of highlighting our community as this wonderful empty nester kind of utopian place to come and spend up your years but then we're kind of losing them off the tracks as well for paying for things. Mm -hmm. But as Jen pointed out there's still a chunk of millage that is attached to all of the residential. It's oh, not that. Yeah. yeah, I get it. I think it's just yeah. how we package it yeah. and how, how yeah. what mm -hmm. the feedback is from the community as yeah. far as giving them the ideas. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Messaging will be important for sure. But I think that. And we plan to you know, have conversations with the community. This is just our first discussion, right? So we don't 
we there is a time we do have a bit of it if we wanted to go on to the ballot in May we need yeah. to know and what our strategy is by if, December if, if we're going to go the income tax route we probably need the timeline is pushed further out for an income tax because of the steps involved mm -hmm. and we would have to really make a decision by um, the December board <coughs> meeting if we're going the income tax route the property tax route we may have one more month because um, it's not quite as extended period of time for the process. You mentioned during your, your presentation that several of the other Wicking County districts already have income taxes. Can you address how many? Yeah, it's about half. Um, Newark, Johnstown, North Fork, Southwest Licking, and I miss one. And across the state, it's about a third of school Northridge. districts that have income no, taxes. No, Northridge had one. I think it's, I think Northridge just did expire. had one and they did not renew it. Look at, did I say Licking Valley? No. Mm -hmm. And Licking Valley. And Licking Valley. So those are the districts that do. Are they about the same amount that we're looking at? They're lower, but also a lot of them are not earned. A lot of them are on total income base, right. not earned income base. Right. Um, I think Newark's is earned, I'm not, and maybe Johnstown is. I think the other three are all way predate when the earned income tax was an option. Which um, was when? Hmm? Which was when? 2006, I think. Okay. Around right, right <coughs> in there. About, about 10, 11 years ago that that became an option. And, and again, across the states, about a third the districts have an income tax. Are they mostly on full income or There's earned income? There's 190 districts that have income tax. <coughs> um, more of them are on all income than earned because older, yeah. they're older. They right. go, some have converted from, earn, from a traditional, it's called a traditional base, which is actually the same base as the state income tax. Um, yeah, you know, a lot of these go back further. A few districts have converted from a traditional base to an earned base, um, which is there's a process for that in the law. But there are probably more that have traditional than earned right now. But the vast majority of the ones that have been passed over the last five to ten years have been earned. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the. Yeah, I'd have to go back. It would take a while to go back and find. The last passed. traditional one where it was passed new. Yeah, there may have been an additional from one Renewal. that was there, but a district that passed the first time traditional levy, it has been quite a while since the district has successfully done that. Almost all of the ones that have passed in the last 10 years have been the earned income tax rather than the traditional. And when we treat them, Mr. Manos mentioned that he was on the committee. When we last tried this back in 2003, it was a traditional right. income tax, not an earned, because earned income was not an option back then. Right. And it was also placed on the ballot after they had just passed a, an, um, a property tax. And they got the board at that time got feedback that they should have tried an income tax at that time. And, and you could probably speak to that a little bit more. And I'm, I'm actually curious mm -hmm. to talk to you. <laughs> so, <laughs> I want to hear your story. Yeah. <laughs> so stick around. Um, but I think uh, it, it was a little bit of a different scenario um, at that time. Right. But I am curious to pick his brain. Yeah. Um, Mike, go ahead, Mike. No, go ahead. I heard from you. Go ahead. So, Mike, I, I, you said you got some good rev information from the Department of Revenue and so forth. Is there a way we can sort of like scenario plan a little bit, use that information to see like, you know, by I household have, what the income and the ta household rate is, by blocks part, or something like that, to of kind of run it through the model and see how it looks. what I have, which was not in any of the slides, is I do have average home values by income range. Oh, yeah, that would be the um, thing you could use. Now, again, it's all yeah. averages because yeah. Yeah. I don't want to release I'm no longer, right. yeah. you know, I used to be, if, I used to be allowed to, to <laughs> see a data by, by address. Indiv address and individual. <laughs> I'm no longer allowed to see that. The fact yeah. that I used to be able to see it is why we have this data in the first place. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, yeah, so I do, but I do have that average home values by, in, you know, income range. I'd be really and curious so to be able to like 
run that by blocks to try and put our like mind in those in those groups heads to try and think are you know are these voters for or against this levy right to kind of push those things around and see yeah right because yeah the thing my, you have to remember though we are working with averages yeah and and yeah. so you know I have no idea what the standard deviation right. range is around those averages and mm -hmm. so yeah yeah it's only you know it's only as good as the average data is good mm -hmm. It's going to vary, it's still probably going to vary widely from individual to individual, and frankly, from year to year. You know, incomes, although with the earned income, not as much as a traditional, but the earned incomes do vary mm -hmm. from year to year. Right. And, you know, the advantage of the earned income tax over a property tax is if you're paying the tax and all of a sudden you lose your job, mm -hmm. well, at least. It was an income tax, and you're not having to pay another nine mils of property tax, which which doesn't really care if you still have a job or not. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, there is some advantage to that with the income tax is that it is, you know, it's a little bit more forgiving if you're in a bad, get into a temporary bad economic <coughs> situation. Right. I think the other thing that we should highlight is you know we passed the levy in 2013. Um, we went through an innovation process. We we've added services that we believe add value to the students' experience in a, in a relatively cost-effective manner, and and it and still kept the promise for the last levy to uh, last five years with some cash in the bank so that we can uh, take this potential approach, um, either or. And, and so I think the fiduciary responsibility, the track record of success of this board, truly, um, I think, does also need to be stated, as well as the product that we have. Because, you know, education is an investment. And, and I think when you have children that go through our system and graduate, you, you realize the benefit of that investment. You do. Um, I did, you know, with my daughter going to an out-of-state school and getting a lot of scholarship money uh, because of her, the work that she had done here and the type of work that she had done here. Um, I know several on the board have some experience with that as well, but I think it is an investment. And, and so I'm not trying to sell. I'm just trying to highlight the fact that it is something that um, I believe is a significant value proposition um, for the money that you pay in. So. Mm -hmm. But I'm slightly biased as a superintendent. <laughs> <laughs> Granted. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. No, I think, I think that's great perspective. Um, I think, first of all, Mike, thanks for the very detailed presentation. It was um, always illustrative. and to me always highlights the um, the terrible job that I have to say that our legislature does in supporting schools um, in frivolously giving away money to um, entities that don't meet any sort of reporting standards at all, whether it's ECOT or others. And I don't mean to lump everybody in that, but, but there's certainly a significant amount of money that's that's been wasted. Uh, as a result of um, funding schemes that uh, don't apply any standards to um, some of those community schools, um, at, at least don't apply the same standards that we have to meet on an everyday basis. Um, thanks for that. Ryan, thanks for the discussion on the report card. Uh, I think that points exactly to the issue that Jeff was talking about. I, I, we have a lot of work, a lot of um, uh, discussion to do to make a decision about which way we go and you know whether whether it's an earned income tax whether it's um, a property tax or even some of the other suggestions that Mike had which is a combination of the two I think I think there there's going to be there will be strong feelings in the community uh, about either just as I suspect there are strong feelings on this board but I think before we even get to that step we have to um, make sure that we continue to 
point to what's been accomplished, it's a school district that's rated in the top 2% of the state that has, I think, been um, very fiscally prudent over the last number of years, um, and yet has added uh, programs that have substantially or will substantially move the needle in the student experience. And I can speak uh, from experience having three students who have graduated from these schools and have gone to um, uh, sought out challenging um, post-secondary education and, and have felt extraordinarily well prepared um, in very competitive environments um, to, um, to be able to go in and, um, and earn the kind of grades that, that, that they want to be able to perform to the level that we would expect. And, so I, and I know others in this community have had the same, have the same uh, experience. So I do think we're going to have to spend a great deal of time um, talking about the product, talking about what it costs, and I don't mean to make this sound like a manufacturing um, play. We're not making widgets here. Uh, but our business is the business of education. I think we do it, uh, this community does it extraordinarily well for a, um, a very fair cost relative to what we know others spend. Uh, it'll be incumbent upon all of us to, to make that case over and over and over again, and we should never assume that um, that everybody understands that. Uh, um, you know, thinking of it, when Thomas was talking about his uh, his analysis, which I commend you, I think was a great analysis, and that, that metric of taking your income and putting a 4x multiplier uh, and and then evaluating whether income tax or uh, mm -hmm. Property tax. I, thought, I should move. <laughs> we should all move uh, yeah. when we look at that. <laughs> right. But that's no. not why we live here, right? right? That's good. Uh, it, you know, uh, I love this community. Great people. Uh, beautiful environment. Lovely um, homes. Lovely streets. But I live here because of the schools, and I think most people would say the same thing. And so uh, I think our focus has been and will continue to be on doing what we think is best to continue to uh, protect that precious resource. Um, I lean towards the earned income tax, um, but I'm also sensitive to the, to the comments about it. I thought, uh, Mr. Yader, your, your comments are spot on. This is not intended, certainly um, at this point, by I think any of us, as a way to shift the burden to earners. It is, in some senses, could fairly be considered to be more of a use tax, but I don't think that that's it uh, in and of itself. I think there are a number of factors that have, that have um, sort of informed our discussion or our thought process, um, including the fact that uh, we've heard very consistently from uh, folks on fixed incomes, seniors in particular, but folks on fixed incomes, that, that they feel pressed as much as they can be pressed, and it's not our desire to drive um, them out. At the same time, I think, Andrew, you raise a great point. We, we don't want to do, to, uh, to create uh, tremendous hurdles for young folks to, to move into this community. And so uh, none of us join this board because we want to raise taxes. <laughs> uh, we join this board because we care about the schools and we pay for them through taxes. But I think we have to, we have to continue the discussion. Um, I'm also um, sensitive uh, especially as we've had a number of uh, discussions in the past couple of years about economic sustainability. I'm sensitive to the imbalance that we have in the community. Um, we're much higher residential base than we are commercial base in, in terms of taxes, which is um, not terrible because we're a residential community, but, but ultimately it puts a significant burden on the businesses that are here. And um, we need to also be mindful of the fact that um, we're, you know, we're, it doesn't serve anyone in the community well to, to create a new uh, tax structure which drives away businesses or discourages the types of businesses who want to come here uh, from, from coming here. So just a whole lot of data to, to, to contemplate, uh, a lot of discussion I think we have to have. I know there's plans in place to have a number of community meetings. But the one thing we know going forward is our costs are going to go up. Um, you know, Mike, the budget forecast that you had in the, in the out year showed salary increases, and, I, you know, and I, I've heard comments from folks in the community, and, I, and I've hastened to correct them. It's not that we're planning significant salary increases for teachers. It's that we're planning to have more teachers. Uh, mm -hmm. Our costs will go up. We know our costs will go up in, in, um, in other areas, too. 
we certainly have a um, an aging uh, set of facilities here. The, the newest building we have in the district is over 15 years old now. We just replaced the roof there. We have um, we have fixed costs that uh, have been manageable and we continue to manage them, but we'll, we'll need to address them going forward. We have other areas where we know that our physical assets are at the end of their useful life and we've got to spend money on them. And we certainly know that, um, not that we expect any help from Washington, D.C., but things like health care costs are probably going to continue to rise. Uh, energy costs will continue to rise. Um, it is reasonable to project that um, personal incomes, salaries that we pay will continue to rise. And we're a business that 85% people costs, salaries and benefits. Um, you know, our, our, uh, doesn't cost us any more one year to the next for a classroom, but the, but the, the cost in, in human capital will continue to go up. And so we've got to continue to, to work to address that. So I guess what I, what I would just say is I think I, I look forward to the discussion. I look forward to, to contemplating the options in front of us. Um, uh, as I said, I, I tend to favor at this point uh, the earned income tax, um, but I haven't made up my mind. But I also think we just need to continue to be mindful of what we've done so well, I think, over the last number of years is, is to, to be good stewards and to communicate that fact to the community so that folks, um, we're asking them to, to give us more money. Um, and we're always mindful of the fact that it's the community's money, this is a community asset. We just need to make sure we tell that story because it's a good story of what we spend and what we achieve. And I think, I think um, something this community can be proud of. Okay. Anything else at this point? To be continued. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank All you right. for your input. You can certainly email Mike if you can, you know, things pop into our head along the way and in between discussions and things. So we should you know, mm -hmm. have them prepared with more details Great. at our next discussion. Okay. All right. Moving on to um, the action agenda. Oh, no, sorry. Board report. Board report. Board report. One, one quick update from the Granville Education Foundation, or a few things. It's a uh, new year, new school year, great energy coming out of that group. Um, they're just uh, uh, in the process of their fall grant cycle right now, where we hope to give some great grants for innovative teaching for uh, the staff and buildings. Um, they also are restructuring slightly their committee structure within the GEF to reflect the fact that they're doing more events, like the Red, White, and Boom event that's an alumni-focused event and hopefully more, so they've got some more focus on that. Um, that's separate from the marketing and communication group, as well as they've started uh, recently a new development group, which is really kind of focused more on how we reach out to you know, targeted donors and businesses um, that's outside of a traditional you know, mailing an annual letter, which we've relied on for much of the revenue the GEF has had. So hopefully we'll hear more from that group and the ways that they can engage the businesses and others in the community to. Uh, continue to find ways to get them to support um, great innovative teaching. So just some quick updates, but it's going well. One clarification, it's not red, white, and boom. That's oh. the, that's the blue, white. Yeah, what is it? Blue, white, and boom. Blue, white, and boom, yeah. excuse me. Yeah. 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 Blue, white, yeah. I was like, we are not funding that fireworks. <laughs> no, that's too much. <laughs> All right. Blue, white, and boom. Yes. Okay, now, we, now the action agenda. Okay, uh, action item 11.01. The uh, Educational Service Center, Central Ohio contract for uh, behavior intervention specialist and teacher of the visually impaired. So moved. Second. Thank you. Any? This is a our typical contract with them for services that they provide to students with special needs. Any other questions? All right. Take the roll, please. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Janine. Aye. Mr. Kahn. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Dr. Foreman. Aye. 11.02 is the English Language Learner uh, Manual or Handbook. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Okay. And really the changes are minimal. Um, they are just uh, updates related to um, policy changes at the federal level and st state and federal level. Any questions? Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Kong. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Dr. Cornman. Aye. Thank you. Uh, consent agenda item 12.01A through C through D. A yeah, through D. D. Through D. Yep. Yeah. A through okay. D. 
So moved. Sorry, do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Okay, so as always, um, I'd like to highlight all the many donations and gifts that we received, uh, especially from the GES, GIS, PTO, um, Kiwanis, Rotary. Um, we also had a new AED uh, that was being donated to, so that we can use it for traveling practices. Um, and then uh, Mound Builders and um, the halls who donated a thousand dollars to the archery program. Uh, we also have a lot of our winter supplementals, and then our typical employment items. I uh, highlight one resignation. Um, Todd Mann has been a bus driver for us for several years, and uh, appreciate his service to the community. Um, this again highlights how important the support organizations like the PTO are for us, right? I see that there's uh, money for both project-based learning and technology. Mm -hmm. Do they allow us to primarily direct or do we help them find projects or how and what's included in like project-based learning and technology? Yeah, so basically what happens is the um, principals work with the PTO board mm -hmm. to highlight what um, items they want or need and then they have an expenditure for each year in the off years of the auction based on the previous auction um, generation. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yes, we do. And those are things that would be normally outside of our typical budget, but yeah. there are things that are gone. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Any other hmm. questions on the consent agenda? Okay. Right. Take roll, please. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Khan. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Dr. Foreman. Aye. Uh, financials. Okay. Um, first is the monthly financial <coughs> statement for August. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Um, as you've heard most everything that's in there already, I think the only page, there's nothing that is in most of it that we haven't already talked about in one way or other. The only page I want to direct you to is the last page of the report, which is something uh, if we was not part of the of the five year forecast, just so that you are aware, um, this is all positive news. Um, this is, we received our second half tax settlement. Um, the great thing, if you look at the what's called the class one collection rates, um, current collection rates for last year for residential property was ninety eight point eight percent, which means that. 98.8% of our taxpayers pay their taxes on time and in full on the residential side, which is excellent. Um, the business rate is around 94%, um, which is not not as good, but still pretty good as, as business taxes go. Um, the rest of it um, is just the breakdown of where, of where the, the money came from relative to where it was last year. Um, there's nothing real exciting in there. The one thing you will notice is, you know, we had the big drop in class two delinquencies. The one last fall was particularly high because of some property sales um, and some long-time delinquents getting caught up. This year's is much more normal. Um, and these numbers will decline over time. We, we want them to decline over time because delinquencies decline as tax payers are current. If, if tax payers are paying currently, they're not building up delinquencies. So that's actually a good thing. And that was the only thing I really wanted to point out that's different from what we've heard in the five-year forecast. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions about the, any questions about the financial, monthly financial report? Can you go over it again? Uh, no. <laughs> that's for the next item for the five-year forecast. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right. Take the roll, please. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Cohn. Aye. Dr. Kornman. Aye. Second next item, 12.02, is the adoption of the five-year forecast. So moved. Second. Okay. I will assume that you do not want to hear my presentation again. Mm -hmm. Not so much. Not so much. Um, I always enjoy it, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> any, any last questions before we vote on it? No. I will be fine. I still have to write the notes for it. Um, I will probably write them over the next week or so. I'll send them to everybody once they are written and then go ahead and file. We actually, we're actually adopting this a month early. Um, it's not due to October 31st. 
good. Okay, thank you yeah. all. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Kahn. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. 12.03 actually should not be there. Um, it was a placeholder for 12.05 and didn't get taken out until 12.05 got added. So that is actually to be withdrawn. All right, we'll strike that from the agenda then. Um, 12.04 is the permanent appropriation resolution. Um, in your folders, you have the permanent appropriation. Um, it does not differ greatly from the preliminary one that was that we passed in late June. Um, so the only so you have a motion to approve the floor. Oh, yeah. sorry. Okay. Second. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah, thank okay. you. Sorry, my fault. Um, the the PI appropriation is a little bit higher than what we approved in June because of a couple projects that did not get completed before the fiscal year switched over and fell into this year. And really the only other change, the only other change is um, the, most of the federal grants have changed because we did not have all our allocations still when we had the end of June, so that's a little different. Um, the auxiliary funds actually went down because there ended up being a provision in the law that um, Welsh Hills no longer comes through the district. They are funded directly by the state now. Um, Granville Christian still does, but Welsh Hills does not. So that's all out of there now. I had an estimate in there for it because that had not been finalized still at the time of the, of, actually, no, it may have been finalized, but I didn't realize it was in there. I hadn't seen it. I, that was something I had not seen in the bill until a little bit later after I was reviewing it. Other than that, nothing is substantially different um, from what it was in June. Any questions? No. All right, thank you all. Is the Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Cohn? Aye. Mr. Janine? Aye. Dr. Corman? Aye. Okay. 12.05 is just a procedural um, move. So moved. Second. Um, all this is doing, um, as we get move into our athletic facilities re work that we're going to be doing, um, there may be instances where, yeah, the boosters can be do, doing most of the fundraising or committee will be, but there may be instances where donations are made directly to the district. And all I want to do is establish a special cost center within the capital fund to deposit the money into to keep it segregated from anything else that we're doing um, so we know what we're you know, what we've gotten in is taking out. It, it's strictly, I have, we actually don't even have to do this by law, but I wanted to go ahead and Again, be transparent and to, to recognize that we're setting this up um, okay. so that it's there. Great. Good. Any questions? Okay. All right, thank you all, please. Mr. Janice. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Kahn. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Make a motion to adjourn. Do you have a second? Second. Thank you. Oh, I, any discussion? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Denise. Aye. Mr. Kahn. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.